All right, and I'm recording. Cool. Um, dentist was good, so I have a mouthful of Novocaine, so if I'm not enunciating very clearly, I apologize, but it should get better. And yeah, dentist... We're going to go over the ODP, we're going to go over PA1, and we're going to go over service learning projects. And we're going to talk about homework too, and we're going to do all kinds of stuff. And I feel like, um, like mostly people are up to speed, so we're going to pick up the pace this week and um, start moving deeper into all these topics. Um, let me start with homework too. So, as I posted in an announcement, um, I got homework two graded, um, and about 15-20% um, of the assignments were not completed correctly, and I listed some possible reasons um, in an announcement. You've got to, got to, got to get homework two done, right? Um, because that's how you submit everything in this class is through Git. So, what I'd like you to do is, is make sure you go back and reread the assignment as carefully as possible and then read it again and make sure you've done all of the steps and when you figure out what's going wrong go ahead and correct it send me an email let me know okay I will regrade and you can you can still get full credit because this is a special assignment this is the one that you know everything else is built on so um, so make sure that you do each of these steps right the one time setup um, of GitLab um, and making a um, separate directory on your your Unix machine, making a GitLab repo named uppercase CSE224, and then um, go ahead and add a README. Um, but then this part, a lot of people missed. Make a subdirectory called HW002, and then put a README in there. Add that. Commit that. Push that, and then. Um, add me as a reporter, um, which was up here, and then send me an email with a subject, G-I-T colon space and your GitLab username, exactly like that. All this has got to be done exactly the way it's described, though. If, if you call this HW space 002, I will not see it. If, if you send a subject, my username is, it's not going to get loaded. So, so make sure you've done all of this. Um, and if you can't find what the issue is, come by office hours tomorrow and we'll, we'll run through it. Um, the good news is once you've got this done, right, you're, you're basically set. All you got to do as you go forward is, you know, make a subdirectory when you start a project, get add, get commit, get push. Just keep doing that. And at any point, um, you know, your latest version is always submitted. So you don't have to worry about you know, submitting by the deadline as long as you're, you're pushing things through and get as you go. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the 224, um, homework 002 section. Um, let me talk about ODP 406. And, um, ODP grades are posted from last week also, so for the first three ODPs. Um, so hop on to the Linux server. And um, take a look at the README. And so this is this is an ODP that will help you with programming assignment one. It's the output part of PA one, the part that shows you the pile of sticks. Um, and in this case, we're just writing a, a script that stands by itself, that reads a number from the user and then outputs. And so you're not going to be able to use the script exactly in PA1, but the part that, that deals with generating this output, that's something that you'll be able to reuse. So what does ODP 406 do? Um, when you run the script, it waits for the user to type a number. The user types in an integer, and then it prints out that many pipes, parentheses, the number that the user typed in, and it closed parentheses. Again, in exactly this format. You can't put spaces between the sticks. You can't put spaces before the parentheses, and so on. Okay, um, to do this, make it sure you understand the echo dash n command. Echo will, you know, take whatever you type 
and just display it on your screen, but it always puts a new line at the end. If you say echo dash n, it suppresses that new line. So in this case, it will print out exactly H-E-L-L-O, and then it's done, which means that my next command line prompt comes right after that O instead of coming after a new line. So how can we do ODP 406? Um, so read a number. Initialize a variable. Well, that counter, that variable, is less than your number. Echo a pipe. Um, I don't want you using for loops in bash, so I want you to do a while loop. For, uh, for the ODP, for loops will be fine, but, but for programming assignments you turn in that I grade, you're not allowed to use for loops, and we'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, so, so this will basically loop, you know, num times, and each time through the loop it will print out another pipe. So if num is 5, this will print out 5 pipes, 5 side-by-side um, -side pipes, and then echo, um, you know, parentheses, dollar sign, num, close parentheses, and you're done. Right, so it's, it's a pretty uh, simple algorithm, and it's not bad to implement in Bash. Um, the main trick is having echo dash n, so you can print a pipe but not return. So it's like doing a printf without a backslash n. Um, so do that, read a number, print out that many pipes, and then at the end just print out a pair of parentheses with a number in between, and this echo without the dash n will automatically put the new line at the end. So when you run this, um, you know, if the person types in 23, it will print out 23 pipes side by side, parentheses 23, and then a new line. So that's what the behavior you want in ODP 406. And then go ahead and run this and submit it for grading and hopefully you get 10 out of 10. Another question? Sure. Okay, um, it should be working equally well, whether it's a for loop or, or a while loop. Let me take a peek because this is usually helpful for everyone to see. Yeah, go ahead and send me an attendance ping while I'm while I'm thinking about this. So I'm I'm going to say make sure you're assessing the right program, make sure that your script is executable, um, and see if see if one of those issues might be going on. Also, you can try, in this case, you can try running your script from the command line and make sure that it, that it runs successfully there. All right, hopefully everybody pinged me.
All right, let me talk about uh, any other questions on ODP 406? Um, so, so let's look at the bash statements.pdf. So the very beginning of it says while loops. Um, so while condition do bunch of statements and then done. So what we would do is, you know, read a number, initialize I equals zero while dollar sign bracket bracket dollar sign I space dash LT space dollar sign num if you like do and then these things i equals dollar sign paren paren i plus one and then done right this is pseudocode not bash um but yeah that's that's the basic syntax for it okay i i, I just went straight i guess i went straight to this in comparison because i missed that part that okay oh okay. <laughs> uh, yeah you can do numbers too all right any other questions All right, let me talk about um, requirements for bash scripts. So, um, synopsis of how to write different types of statements. Please note that there are many ways to write these statements, but in order to receive credit on assignments, homeworks, and tests, you need to use these constructs, okay? So ODPs, you can do fours if you like. Um, but anything that you're turning into grade or anything you're writing on an exam, um, I need you to do it exactly like this, right? Your while loops need to be while space bracket bracket space condition. Your conditions either have to be double equal signs for comparing strings or one of these for comparing numbers. If you're going to do an if statement, it's got to be if space bracket bracket space and then condition where again your condition can be one of the these for numbers or a double equal or exclamation equal for comparing strings. Um, and then for evaluating arithmetic expressions, you got to do dollar sign paren paren, put your expression inside the parentheses. Um, and, and there are other ways to do it. And when you're not turning in something for me to grade, you're welcome and encouraged to do whatever makes the most sense to you. But bash in particular, I got to be really kind of picky about this because I need to know if you actually understand what you're doing or if you just changed your code enough times until you got it to work and it happened to work, but in a different situation it might not work. And there's lots of examples of this where, you know, if we're testing to see if x equals zero, you might be able to get away by with, with having some, you know, missing space here or an extra space here or something, and it might happen to work. Right, but if you were checking to see if x was something other than zero, that might not work. Um, so I want you to stick to these these constructs, right? Uh, stick to those exactly. And if you already know Bash and you already got habits on how to do this stuff, I apologize for making you do it a particular way. Um, but that's that's really the only time I'm going to get super picky about it. Um, so I posted some sample code from the afternoon section um, on Friday where we just kind of wired up some of these statements. So if you go to the shared code area, there's two files in there, try it and try it too. Try it was an example of using a while loop with an if statement thrown in the middle. So, you know, initialize the counter to 10 in this case, and while it was not zero, echoed it and then decremented it. And an if statement, if we happen to have x equal to five, we printed a message. And then try it too is basically the same thing, but it's comparing strings. So it reads in a string from the user x, right? And if it's not equal to by, it says say by and reads another number. And it will loop like this until the person says by, and then it'll exit and say goodbye. And these are, you know, simple demonstrations of these constructs, but they're also, you know, an idea for how you can actually code up pieces of 
of PA1. For example, in PA1, you need to ask the user who wants to go first, user or computer, and they need to type either a U or a C. And here's, you know, an example where we're telling the user something and asking them to type the word BYE, and we keep asking them until they do that. So if you need hints on how to get started on, you know, pieces of PA1, you'll see things that we do in code that, that should help with that. Um, and, um, you know, ODP 406 obviously is, is helpful in terms of producing that output for, um, for the pile of sticks. All right, um, let's talk about, um, let's talk about the service learning project. And then af after we go through this, I'll spend the rest of the class talking about PA1, basically. And we'll talk about that today. We'll probably talk about it some tomorrow. I want to go through algorithms and how to break your code into pieces and just kind of some ideas. If you're unsure how to really kind of like get into the meat of PA1, um, this should help. But hopefully you already spent some time over the weekend taking a stab at PA1, and then we can just sort of fill in maybe some of the missing pieces here. Um, but let's first talk about your service learning project. So the SLP is coming up due October 8th, I believe. Um, and let me see. All right, so um, SLP proposal is due October 8th. So, so what is the service learning project? Um, it's kind of like a capstone project, but, but um, it's only a, a three-quarter, you know, three-term project here at Clark only, right? So it's 40-some weeks. Um, the idea is basically, you know, when you're in school, you're taking classes and you're doing homework and you're doing tests and you're getting grades and you know you come out of school and what do you have to show for your time you've you've got a transcript which says I took all these courses and I passed them with a C or better right and that's that's important that gets you you know admission to higher level classes at a university and so on and so forth but if you're if you're competing for you know a job an internship a fellowship a scholarship something like that um what do you have that you can show that puts you above other people right what can you you do to showcase your talents the particular things that you learned the things that go beyond you know i went to class and i did my work um so the service learning project is one answer to that. And it's a, a year-long project, right? Fall, winter, spring. Um, that lets you work on something larger and challenging and outside of what you're doing in your classes. And the good news is it can be anything that you want, more or less. You get to pick this project yourself. The bad news is it can be anything you want. I don't give you a particular thing to do. So, so you need to sort of decide what you want to work on. And then you need to figure out all of the details. This is like, you know, writing a new experiment in Engineering 250 or 270, right? You're coming up with this project yourself, which means you have to specify, you know, what is the goal what am I trying to accomplish? What needs to be done by the end of this this uh, project? Um, what constitutes success, right? What's in scope? What's out of scope? What resources do I need? How am I going to get those resources? What am I even trying to do? And how am I going to do that? And how does that compare to what other people do, right? This is a, a large scale undertaking, right? But it's it's totally um, it's totally your doing, right? You get to pick it, you get to um, to manage it, um, you get to adjust it and tweak it along the way. So the beginning of this happens in fall in 224, and it starts with your SLP proposal, and this is a document that you're going to create and submit on Canvas by October 8th. 
and I'll look at it and and you know either accept it as is or give you some feedback and and we'll modulate on it and so on and so forth. But this will basically set the stage for work you're going to do throughout this entire entire course and then throughout 222 and then 223. So it's something you want to spend some time on and really the goal of of this first quarter SLP is to to really refine your proposal to get a very clear idea what it is you're going to do. Now that doesn't mean you can ignore this until the end of the term and then say yeah I think I'm going to make a video game, right? You need to like be spelling this out in detail in the next couple of weeks and then starting to work on it doing the research the background getting the the initial version of this um, into a shape where you can either say okay this is going to work I can keep building on this throughout winter term or you say you know this was a little ambitious I need to change direction or this was really easy and so I'm just going to you know pick something different because I already finished this um, and so, yeah, there are examples of this that you can find. Um, if you're in the STEM building, um, there's a hallway back in that area where my office is, next to the Nerd Cave. There's a hallway, and it has posters all along that hall. Um, and those are our former students' um, SLPs. Um, somewhere out here, I think it's under ECS Club. Um, Uh, yeah, so go under ECS Club, um, and then uh, Project Documentation, Sample of Past Projects. So if you click on this, you'll see um, videos that students have made for their, their presentation. So there's 46 examples here. And you don't have to watch them all, but you can just kind of look at the titles if you want and get an idea, right? Um, ultrasonic Suspension Device, uh, Response Time Tester, um, Electric Penny Board, STEM Biobot. Um, mailbox checker and you know if these sound intriguing um, to you you can you can watch these and um, get an idea so so these can be you know pretty much anything that you can imagine can be turned into a service learning project um, I, I have a problem with fruit flies right now they're they're all over my plants so I could make something that like you know attracts and captures fruit flies in a container so that I can take them outside and release them. That would be a kind of cool SLP. Or something that like, you know, waters my plants but controls how much water is given by measuring the moisture of the soil so that my plants don't get too much water, which, you know, promotes the growth of fruit flies. Um, it can be pretty much anything. So let me show you um, in particular what is due on the 8th. And there's a note here which says, you know, follow the instructions carefully, ask questions if you're unsure. Submissions must be typed and carefully prepared. So I would not, I don't want to see, you know, somebody print this thing out and then just, you know, write by hand a sentence or a few words next to each item. And this last note is also very serious. A one-page submission will likely not earn many points. Now, there's no minimum page requirement, but I want enough information to fully explain everything that we're going to talk about. So, um, so this is, this is the overview that we just did. Um, some information on choosing a topic, instructions for your proposal. So basically I want you to, to create a document that looks like this. Okay. Name is your name. Class is CSC 224. Date is whatever the date is. Pick a project name. Right. I mean, if you really don't want to be creative, you can call it my service learning project. But it's nice to have a name that you can use to refer to it. Um, you can work in. Yeah. Are we able to collaborate? Yes, I was about to say you can work in groups of up to three people. Like not specifically people in this program, but I have a friend who's at UCB for computer science. Mm-hmm. Be able to work with him. Um, I'd like you to stick with people in the class, and it could be this section or the other section. Um. But, but um, yeah, stick with people who are taking CSE 224. Okay. But, you know, if, if you want to carve off some piece um, of a project that you're collaborating on with somebody else, right, and, and do that as your SLP, that's totally fine. As long as, as you can present it as, you know, a standalone piece.
So list uh, full names, please. No initials of um, your partners. You can have up to two partners you're working with, so a total of three people. All right, detailed project description. This can be, you know, a few paragraphs. It can be a few pages. Um, but tell me exactly what it is you're thinking of doing. I'm going to make a video game is not a detailed description. Okay. Tell me, tell me what this video game is all about. What's the gameplay like? You know, what's what's the user going to see when when they interact with it, right? Full detail. So imagine this is this is your pitch to a venture capitalist, and they've got you know fifty million dollars to hand out to anybody who has a really good idea, and you're going to hand them this piece of paper and hope that you can convince them to give you fifty million dollars to work on your project, right? So you wouldn't say, I'm going to make a video game, right? You might say, I'm going to make the most amazing video game that nobody has ever seen, and here's why. Because it's going to track your eye movement, and it's going to control your player by, by uh, observing where you're looking on the screen, right? And then tell me a little bit about how you plan to do that, okay? So, so very detailed project description. Most challenging elements and expected learning outcomes. The goal of, one of the goals of the SLP is to extend your knowledge beyond your classes. So we don't want to, you know, say I'm gonna write a bash script that plays a stick picking game, but it will display, you know, equal signs instead of pipes, right? You really, really, really wanna stretch yourself here. But the challenge is, you know, if you try to stretch yourself too far, um, it, it could be that you're getting over ambitious. So you're going to try to find, you know, a sweet spot where you can really push yourself, but you can still um, achieve whatever goals you set for yourself. Expected learning outcomes. What do you expect you'll learn at the end of this process? It's a, a learning process after all. Um, description of service components. So this is supposed to be a project that, you know, is a benefit to, to others. Um, and almost anything can be, you know beneficial a, a video game is a good way for students to unwind a humane fruit fly trap will you know help people not have to deal with fruit flies a mailbox camera will you know save people from having to walk out in the rain to see if they got their mail yet stuff like that um, if you've already started this project if you've already done some work on a project and you want to continue that as your SLP Tell me what the past progress was and, and where the project is right now, or just say it's a new project. All right, another super critical part of this is milestones. So milestones are markers that are placed along a journey to let you know how far you are from where you started. So milestones in the project are basically um, measurable criteria that let you know, am I on schedule, ahead of schedule, behind schedule. And I want you to list at least three specific milestones for this report. One that you'll accomplish by mid-quarter, so say around, you know, the fifth or sixth week of the course. Another milestone saying what you want to accomplish by the end of the quarter. And then at least one milestone for what, what um, you'd like to accomplish down the road. Um, and these need to be measurable. They need to be something that when you get to, you know, whatever due date you assign for this milestone, you can look at your progress, you can look at the milestone's measure of success and say yes or no. Did I hit that milestone or not? Right? So, so, um, so an example of a good milestone is, um, let's, let's run with the video game idea, right? Good milestone will be, um, I will have completed at least two tutorials on Unreal, and I will have a uh, basic gameplay running on my laptop where I can uh, use my mouse to change my point of view and look around an environment. And then my milestone by the end of the quarter might be I will have a player that I can move around using WASD um, in conjunction with changing my point of view with the mouse. And I will also have completed a tutorial on blueprints, right? So those, those are very easy to look, you know, at, at the date that you say you're going to do this and say, did I do tutorials? Well, you did or you didn't. You know, I only did one. Okay, so I didn't meet that milestone. Can I look around? Well, I've got a, a view of the room, but it doesn't respond to my mouse yet, right? Um, so, so weak milestones 
um, would be something like, you know, um, do some initial work on, on the game. And by the end of the quarter, have a basic game working. Well, there's, there's no clear way to look at what you've done and say, is this a basic game, right? I mean, you may know what that means, but the person who gave you $50 million, do they know what that means, right? So you want to be able to demonstrate. Um, is there a specific set of programming languages this needs to be in? Nope, it's pretty much up to you. Um, you can use any language you want. You can invent your own language. This does not have to include any programming at all. Now, it's got to be something, you know, technology-related, computer science, electrical engineering. But, you know, if, if you really decided what you wanted to do was build a, a, a solar-powered um, phone charger, right, you could do that. Um, but that would probably still have some programming, too. But, um, but it, it's really an opportunity to take what you're interested in and get, get credit for working on that. Right. All right, so major challenges anticipated because we want this to be something challenging. This should not be something that you've already done and you can do in your sleep and knock out in one weekend. It should be something that's going to take you 30 or 40 weeks. So what are the biggest challenges and what do you plan to do about them? And then just kind of like, you know, for my own interest partially and for you to also reflect on, why are you choosing this project? Right? What is it about it? What are your specific interests that relate to this project? What do you hope to learn from this project? And then how do you think this will benefit um, your education? So that's some ideas. You can certainly go outside this and include more information, but, but um, these are at least the areas that I want to see explained. And you don't have to um, fit it all on one page. Like I say, if you squeeze this all on one page, almost certainly you don't have enough information in here. All right, and we can iterate on this, but make sure you submit this by um, October 8th, PDF upload. What are the limitations of this project? I don't really know if there are any. Um, I mean, you can't do anything illegal. So, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but... Um, Say again? Why is that an ah? Uh, I'm just being dumb. <laughs> an auto turret. Oh. Or you know, light laser guided brass knuckles or something like that. But brass knuckles are technically illegal to make in Washington. Um how long should the project take? Um it should be something that that stresses your understanding, that, that exp expands your, your knowledge base. Um, I'm not so much concerned with how many hours it takes, um, but I want there to be, you know, some significant chunk of learning that happens in doing this. So it should be something challenging. Um, but, you know, well, I was going to say typically, but typically, you know, a lot of students ignore this until the end of the term and then they rush through it. But typically, if you're working on this steadily, right, you could expect to be spending a few hours on this every week. Um, it's a small part of your grade numerically, but it's an important part of, of the education process. And it gives you something really nice at the end of, of your time here at Clark to have on your resume, to put in your portfolio, to show to other people, and so on. And it's a little bit of a warm-up to, you know, like a capstone project, which is usually a fairly intense, um, very large group oriented project um, that most universities have. Uh, let's see. Um, funny program that would use voice recognition to automatically send attendance pings through Zoom. Is this considered illegal? No, it's not. Um, that, that would actually be pretty fantastic. Um, I don't know. I would guess, but you know, if you do it on Linux, you can always tap into your microphone um, and pick up whatever is being said through your speaker. Um, it's pretty extensive too. There's also some funny things with Windows where you can where there's like virtual. Uh, I think I forgot what it's called, virtual cables or something like that, where you can do a similar thing, but it's also very jank. Okay. 
Yeah, um, audio is always an interesting, interesting realm. Um, let's see, can I use the project to essentially explore its feasibility? Yeah, within reason. Um, what you don't want to do is spend, you know, 11 weeks of fall term um, thinking about a project and then at the end of fall say, you know, this is not at all reasonable. I'm back to square zero. And then in winter, you have to find a new project. We really don't want that to happen. So so by the midterm point, week five or week six, you should probably have a pretty good idea. Am I in at least the right area? So, you know, if you want to do a cold fusion generator, um, you know, put together a proposal, good chance that, you know, once you start digging into it, you're going to say, okay, that's probably not feasible with my resources and my time frame. So, um, you know, you would, you would shift to something else like a solar power generator or something. Um, so yeah, you're going, you're going to spend a lot of this term checking the feasibility and so on, but keep, keep modulating and adjusting and course correcting as you go. Um, um, if we, if we like go through this real life, we, we set up where they, we can choose. Do we just like write up, uh, so this is, this is just technical analysis. Okay. We like write about what we've done so far. If we end up realizing, oops, we, uh, we did, this is not feasible. Do we just write about like how it's not feasible, what we've done so far, this and that? So, so keep in touch with me, right? This is, this is a good use for email. Um, Keep in touch with me, and and like I say, by the midterm point, you should probably have a pretty good idea that you're on on the right um, general track. But it's possible, you know, as you get closer, you may find, um, you know, making a 3D first-person video game in Unity is really hard, and I don't understand um, C++, and I haven't had time to learn it. And so, you know, you might scale it back and say, okay, I'm going to do a side-scroller or something like that. Um, but just... just um, you know, keep me looped in if you're making course corrections. And um, a lot of times by the end of, of the first quarter, fall, um, you may not have actually made a lot of forward progress towards, you know, your final goal, um, but you've learned a lot and you've, you've discovered a lot and that would be stuff that you could put in your write-up. Um, and at, at the end of the term, there's an upload that you make. So this is due November 23rd. And um, and this is basically a PowerPoint, and you download this template and you fill it in, and you upload this um, by the deadline. It's basically your project title, date, name of the team, and the people, and then you know you fill in these based on what you've learned. So what's the basic problem? What did you find from your research and competitive analysis, and so on. Um, detailed solution that you're proposing and applications. Now, when we're in person, right, people submit these, um, we send them to the printer and you get, you know, this nice 17 by 11 cardboard version of your poster. And then we have a big expo the last week of the quarter and everybody comes in and visits and you talk to people about your project and you show them your posters and things like that. Um, with COVID, right, we're, we're doing this remotely, so that's not an option. So the presentation is usually done through Zoom. But winter, we should be back in person. And, um, and so at the end of winter term, we'd have an in-person presentation, hopefully. Um, tentatively, November 30th is, is the Zoom presentation, but we'll, we'll do more details when we get closer to that. Is there a maximum group size, or is it, kind of, or is it like proportional to like, uh, every member has yeah, maximum group size is three people, so you can have up to two partners. Okay. And and when you're when you're choosing your partners, choose carefully, right? Inevitably, um, somebody you know will come to a group and say, "Hey, can I work on your SLP with you? I haven't been able to think of one." Um, and then you know a few weeks later, I get a message from from somebody saying, you know, this person joined my group, but I've never seen them. They don't respond to emails. I don't know what to do, right? So so have a conversation, you know, with people who you're thinking of working with, and and make sure that you know this seems like a good fit, as opposed to you know I don't know what to do and I don't want to work alone, so I'm just going to join a group. Um, and a big part of this is, is you know, the whole question of, of group dynamics, being able to 
take a project and break it into pieces and and bring the pieces back together and track progress among different subgroups and so on and so forth so um, all right um the handout the bash how to guide tells you how to do arithmetic in bash it'll show you how to increment something um if you have a variable like i i equals five echo dollar sign i it's five i equals dollar sign paren paren i plus one close paren close paren echo i i is now six all right so you can do any arithmetic you like like that I would suggest staying away from plus plus and minus minus in bash though because it it seems like it should work and sometimes it works but sometimes it doesn't why make life harder on yourself right this will always successfully increment i you can use that um all right um any other questions on the slp All right, so let's sketch out some, some pseudocode for programming assignment one. Um, I'll be writing a lot of pseudocode in this class, so what is pseudocode? It's, it's human-readable um, code. It's not bash, it's not C, but it may look like those sometimes. But it's really meant to be, you know, something that's easy for people to read. Um, and easy, you know, to translate later into a language that a computer can read. So what's easy for me may be different from what's easy for you. So pseudocode is, is individual. When I started programming, I called these Pudgy's napkin flowcharts because I would go to Pudgy's Pizza and I would write on the back of their napkins at lunchtime. And, and I would write stuff like this, pseudocode. So, so what does the pseudocode look like for our stick game? Um, yeah, it's an algorithm, exactly. So stick game, right? Print some sort of intro and then ask for the number of sticks. Are we allowed to use functions for bash? Absolutely. Uh, okay, cool. Functions will make your code a lot nicer to work with, too. All right, so print an intro, ask for the number of sticks. I'm just going to pull this up um, so I don't do something ridiculous like change the assignment on you. I'm starting to be able to feel my mouth again, so this is promising. All right, so um, game should greet the user, ask how many sticks to play with, must be an integer bigger than or equal to 15. Um, so ask for the number of sticks. If um, less than 15, print a message and go back up here. And we're gonna do that forever. All right, then it asks who should go first, and it should be a C or a U, and if it's not a C or a U, you should ask again. So, um, ask who goes first. If not U or C, print message, and go back up to the top. All right, so this is just, just set up, basically, right? Print an introduction, get the number of sticks, get the information about who goes first. And then we go into kind of our main loop. All right, so um, if it's the user's turn, what do we want to do? Um, ask user how many sticks to take get the answer if their answer is illegal ask again if the second time that you ask they give you an illegal answer game's over so print a message, tell them they're a cheater, and exit the game. All right. Otherwise, um, 
Let me suppose. Yeah. Such a silly detail. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So suppose the answer is is in a variable called num, right? So it's it's this is all for the user's turn. Ask how many to take. They put in the number of sticks they want to take. Let's call that num. Okay. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to do something like total equals total minus num. Show the pile of sticks. If total equals zero, the game is over. The user won. So print a message, tell them that they won, they got lucky this time, and the game's over. All right, there's a few different things we can do at this point, right? Once the user has taken a turn, we know it's the computer's turn next. And so we could, we could do the user's turn, and then the computer's turn, and then go back to the top inside a big loop. Or we could have a variable that says whose turn it is, we set that variable up here, and now we can just say, you know, if it's the user's turn, do this, and then change that variable. Set my turn variable to say it's the computer's turn, and then my next section is going to say if it's the computer's turn. So when, when you're designing a program like this, there's different levels at which you need to, to be writing an algorithm. There's the very high level, the basic game flow steps, there's the very low level. How do I know if their answer was legal? Well, I want to know if their answer was bigger than or equal to one and less than or equal to three. And it's, it's possible to design your code like this, but it's easier if you sort of think of breaking it into chunks, where each chunk sits at a different level of, of uh, detail. So what I might do is, is start very high level and say something like this. I'm going to do an intro. And I'm going to say if user turn. I'll do it like a flow chart. So is it the user's turn? And if it is, do user turn. And then, is it the CPU's turn? And if it is, do the CPU turn. And then go back up to the top. And so after I do the user turn, I'll set, you know, turn equals CPU. After we do the CPU turn, I'll set turn equal to a user and I'll check those in these conditions well I gotta have an exit condition somewhere so maybe down here and down here I would check if the game is over so you start you start building out your program and you can start from the high level perspective or you can start from the low level perspective how am I going to print out this pile of sticks this set of pipes side by side with a number in parentheses. Well, that's ODP 406. So, so in reality, you'll probably ping back and forth between these. But, but think about the overall flow. Wow, we are out of time. That went fast. Um, and um, we'll probably spend all of tomorrow talking about more of this, more of the details about how we can we can wire up PA1 and make that work. All right, send me a, um, an attendance ping, um, and I will see you next time. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Hope your better. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. All right, you too. See you. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. See you later.